Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining uh, Data Art plus AWS uh, webinar today. We're continuing in our series, uh, doing a deeper dive into data and analytics services provided by AWS. Um, uh, data Art is a uh, as an advanced consulting partner. We specialize in data and analytics solutions for our customers. So today, what we want to do is want to show you the power of the integrated suite of services for data and analytics on AWS in action. And to do that, we're going to use uh, what we call the uh, AWS Lakehouse Blueprint or a solution accelerator that we built in with uh, input and in collaboration with our colleagues in AWS. And we use that to accelerate our customers' data journey in the cloud. So the things that we're going to focus on today is demonstrating how quickly and easily you can set up a data lake, how you can start ingesting data in virtually minutes, how you can uh, query your data in your data lake using different mechanisms, how you can do quick and easy transformations, including serverless transformations of that data without the ETL, um, how you can set up important access uh, aspects such as access control, security, uh, how you can catalog your data, how you can set up data sharing, how you can leverage that data in the data warehouse Redshift the solution that AWS provides, and also uh, what you can do uh, very quickly, again, and relatively easily, we're using the QuickSight service to stand up BI and visualizations and dashboards and things of that nature. Uh, a lot of exciting content. So let me very briefly introduce our wonderful speakers today. Uh, we have uh, John Lucking, who is a principal solution architect with the insurance team at AWS. Hi, John. Hey, Peter. Hey, uh, thank you very much for joining. Very, very good to have you. Uh, thank you for all your help in, in preparing this event. Um, our other speakers are uh, Oleg Kamisarov, who is a principal consultant and solution architect based here in New York with DataArt. Hi, Oleg. Hi, everyone. Hey. And we also have Alexi Utkin, last but not least, who's a, uh, who leads our data analytics practice at DataArt. He's based in London. He's a principal solution consultant at DataArt as well. Hello, Alexi. hello. Hey. Joining us from 30,000 feet in the air, it seems. Um, sounds like first class or business class. I can't tell. Um, anyway, uh, without further ado, let me just quickly touch upon a, a couple of points of process. You have the Q&A uh, button towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, please use that to type in your questions as we go along. We will save up some time between 10 and 15 minutes towards the end, if all goes well, to answer at least some of your questions. If we don't get to your particular question, we can always continue the conversation offline. And we'll also endeavor to answer uh, all of the questions that are left unanswered during the event after the event in the, in the uh, follow-up emails. I hope that's okay with you. Um, without further ado at this point, I would like to turn it over to John and let's get going. Great, thanks, Peter. So I will uh, share my screen. And re really my goal here is to uh, give you some uh, key takeaways on as you start your data lake and your data warehouse, also known as the lake house uh, journey. And the demo is really the exciting and the key part. And I'll, and I'll lead into that with uh, an explanation of kind of the use case for insurance. And, and so when you follow along and you actually see the insurance specific data on the screen, uh, you'll understand the use case and, and the context. Okay, so, so some key recommendations, right? The, the new technology, and I, I've been doing this for a long time, two years at AWS and, and prior to that CIO and CTO and head of app dev and consultant and builder at uh, many insurance and reinsurance companies. Uh, so I've, I've been through the pain of attempting to bring data uh, into a single place for analysis, for AI ML, ML models, and, and simply for general business reporting and regulatory reporting. We, we all know the challenges associated with that. So along comes a data lake, um, which essentially allows you to bring all your data. And, and as the third bullet there lists, bring in your structured, semi-structured, unstructured data into a place like uh, S3. Highly resilient, super inexpensive storage. So put all your data in there. Bring your uh, relational data from your core policy billing and claim systems, bring your semi-structured JSON or XML data in, and bring your unstructured data, uh, like your customer call recording transcripts, uh, bring your documents all into S3. And, and thus that's your basis, uh, the source data for your data lake, okay? And, and early on, as you 
begin this journey. At Amazon, right, I learned a phrase in the second bullet there, a two-way door. Yeah, realize that you don't have to go about by doing a classic request for proposal and, and selecting um, a large uh, data warehousing solution and going through months and months of negotiation and signing a contract before you can actually touch the tool and play with it. The whole value of the cloud is these are Legos, right? And they're out there. All you have to do is sign up in 15 minutes and start using them. And the challenge our customers constantly say, right, is there's so many Legos, how do I work with them? So we're gonna give you a pattern here as to how you can start small with just a handful of services, a handful of Legos, and then go from there. And as you move forward, the two-way door decisions, these are reversible decisions. So you do not have to um, go deep into one service and then you're locked in with it. You can back out and try a different service and try a different approach, right? And I'll, I'll touch upon that in a minute. So an example of this would be um, bring your data in S3, as I described. You would crawl your data with something called Glue, which builds your schema. And then you can query it with Athena, right? Which is a, a SQL-based uh, query tool, which uses the Glue schema, which then again goes against the data in S3. In S3. And then finally, you can visualize the data with QuickSight or something like Tableau from AWS Marketplace or, or some other chosen BI solution of choice. And there you've built in days, right, a data lake um, with actual results in the form of queries and visualizations. So you start small, you learn as you go, and you adjust the tools um, as you need to. And, and a key thing, the dream, right, along the whole journey is to have transparency and audibility uh, of your data throughout the whole process. And then later, the whole house piece coming in, the lake house piece coming in, is to think about which subset of your data in the data lake that you wanna aggregate and put into a data warehouse so you can have faster, more performant query results. That's kind of the journey here. And all of this in the first bullet point, right, should really be done with a a cross-functional, dedicated, full-time team uh, of folks from all groups within the business. Everybody from your, your cybersecurity organization, your finance organization, your legal, your builders, actuarial underwriting claims, not just IT. So bring in the folks need it, who have a, need to have a seat at the table, dedicate them to a full-time team, keep the team small and let them go, right? That's the, that's the journey and the recommendation. And, the things we've seen successful over and over. The, the next um, slide here is, I named it the Olympic pattern. And I, and I think you can guess why. If you look in the left, you see bronze, silver, and gold. And what this pattern is, is meant to represent or propose, and again, there is no right or wrong here. This is the art in computer science. This is not a absolute, but it's a suggested pattern that uh, resonates with a lot of insurance and financial services customers. So you take your data from the data sources, you store them in a layer, an S3 set of S3 buckets called the quarantine layer. And what you do there is you strip out and you, you deal with PII data, personally identifiable information or other sensitive data. There's different uh, tools you can choose uh, from different vendors. You could use uh, a tool like Macy, which essentially can be run in a job form and it can be configured to look at, for example, social security numbers. And either you encrypt them, you can mask them, you can tokenize them, you can remove them, you can do all different kinds of things. A common thing with social security numbers is you see asterisks and you see only the last four digits. You could do things like that. Apache Ranger is an open source uh, example, right? Many different tools to do that. But take care of your data in the quarantine allow very limited human access to that layer. And then when everything is taken care of from a security perspective, you move it to the bronze layer. Now the key there is the mutable files from the data sources. So that is the baseline. Everything will trace back to the bronze layer because that data is read only, that data cannot be changed. It was the sensitive data was dealt with in the quarantine layer. All the other data from the source systems is kept there as is. Right, So you trace back to their sources, improve the results and the accuracy of your final analyses and reports by tracing back to the bronze layer. 
Silver layer is where the majority of the action happens. That's where your data is cleansed and transformed so that everything is mapped. Maybe a, a common thing is you might have a CRM system like Salesforce. You might have customer data coming from policy and claims. As you know, customer data uh, changes. Uh, a company name might change over time. An address would certainly change as a business perhaps expands or moves. How do you know it's the same customer? How do you know the historical um, data that your organization has about those customers, whether they're past claims or their uh, expired policies, you can map all your customers and do uh, matching in this layer to create that single customer view, that single customer ID or record, otherwise known as the golden record, right? You can do that in the silver layer and then your gold layer contains those master tables, those single views of the customers. So you know all their policies and current coverages and all their claims history and billing history, okay? So that's your goal, that's the dream layer. Keep in mind uh, the journey, right, can really begin and deliver results very quickly because what you could do is take your data, put it in bronze, you could crawl it with glue to create a schema and then you could start querying and reporting on it immediately. You don't have to go through the development effort and the time it takes to do the silver and the gold layers. You can build this solution iteratively, right? Keep that in mind. And that, that's the real power of the cloud. You can get on quickly, you can choose your solutions fast, and you can build iteratively. And again, the whole two-way doors, a lot of these decisions are reversible and you can adjust as you go. So the case we're gonna talk about here is uh, commercial property submissions and just a little simple history, right? Based upon my experience uh, in PNC insurance, I uh, am familiar with commercial property uh, insurance. So I created a Python script that generated uh, about 75 columns of uh, information related to commercial property submissions. Uh, used uh, the government's national address database, so there's real addresses, um, and put some boundaries around the other fields and came up with some data that made sense. We generated millions of records, um, and then we came up with uh, some XML feeds to kind of mix some data. So the commercial property submissions data is a flat file, uh, a comma-separated value file. The updates that come in throughout the day are XML files. So as the submission status changes from open to working, on hold, rejected, or quoted, uh, that, that will come in in small XML update files. So the scenario is, which is common in insurance, as we all know, you'll get a bunch of submissions in one day, could be anywhere from a few hundred to 10,000, depending on the size uh, of the company. They will come into the data lake. Then the next day, all these updates will come in as the submissions get worked on. So an underwriter might be assigned, uh, some information might be updated that was incorrect, the broker might send new information, uh, the status will change. So all this data is, has come in uh, overnight and then all these small updates are coming in throughout the day. So kind of a real time streaming set of data coming into the data lake, that's the scenario. And now the data flow looks like this, right? And I'm showing you this to kind of keep it simple because the next slide will go into the architecture of the data or data lake solution. And I don't wanna overwhelm you or, or lose people with the architecture, but just kind of think of it in terms of building blocks and think back to that uh, Olympic pattern, the uh, quarantine, the bronze, the silver, the gold layer. So this is an example of just dealing with the bronze layer, crawling it with glue, the data catalog, querying it with Athena, and then visualizing it with QuickSight, right? And then one point here I've been mentioned is a quick way to build a data lake, if you so choose, is a product called AWS Lake Formation, which allows you to secure your data lake. So it provides a DBA familiar uh, create, read, update type security settings that you can easily apply to your, your data in S3. So it, it kind of, removes the abstraction of having to deal with um, understanding um, writing JSON uh, security scripts, if you will, right in S3. It just prevents you with a UI. Um, it presents you with an API that you can programmatically update to secure your data, real, real important, right? And also it integrates with 
a lot of folks have Active Directory, so it integrates with your existing Active Directory groups. Um, so very, very powerful and, and very good solution to take care of security. And one thing about QuickSight is there's really two options. You can do in-memory uh, reports or you can do live reports, right? Live reports are a little slower because they're going against the existing data. In-memory obviously is faster, but the data set in QuickSight needs to be updated. So you have the, have those choices uh, based upon your needs, okay? And lastly, what I have here is uh, kind of a kind of a, a busy slide, right? But we'll leave this with you. We'll share this with you, right? But the idea is there are nine steps, right, to get to the end here, and you can build this again iteratively. And this does not have to be your final solution. There's many different combinations. In this case. Um, Datar chose to use EMR. All the uh, icons within that EMR box, right, are basically check boxes. When you spin up EMR, you, you choose, oh, I want to use Hive, I want to use Scala, or the programming language to write my uh, Spark jobs. I'm going to use Apache Hootie because there are real-time updates coming in and you can do the use the upsert functionality. You could do that. You could just choose to use Glue. You could use, um, Glue has a new ETL solution called Data Brew. You could use that. So there's many different solutions to use here. This is just one example, right? The value of EMR is it's really good for large, big data and it's super performant. But uh, some people either have that need out of the gate or they grow into it, okay? Step functions kind of working backwards to the left there. Step functions are a great way to control uh, and orchestrate the activity and the the firing right of emr jobs and you see on the far right you have your glue lake formation your glue data catalog your crawlers which build the schema which allow athena to query and then you have your different layers right uh, which the purpose of which i described back in the olympic pattern and then lastly from the gold layer ultimately uh, when your solution is built and you iteratively uh, gone in your development journey Right, you have Athena and you have QuickSight. So I hope the the uh, the key takeaways, right, you kind of take to heart and you think about it, but realize that once the team is formed and you dedicate folks full time, you can give them some data and allow them to start with just a few basic functions like S3, Glue, and Athena and QuickSight. So really four services, right, to build. Uh, what's the beginning, what the beginning is, is of your data lake is. And um, keep in mind the quarantine layer and the importance of security with, with uh, Macy and uh, Lake Formation, real important uh, tools to consider. So with, with that, uh, hand, Peter, I'll hand it back to you and uh, look forward to the demo. Thank you so much, John. I think that was an awesome overview of the basic approach and the capabilities and how to think about the cloud journey, the cloud data journey rather with AWS. Fantastic. Oleg, over to you. Uh, let's dive right into the demo if we can. Um, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, okay, great. Uh, thank you, John. So uh, let me walk you through quickly uh, the uh, blueprint implementation. And I have uh, two goals here. We have two goals. From one point of view, we will overview the blueprint. And uh, from another point of view, we on also want to uh, highlight key AWS features that that are not used in this blueprint, but uh, are important for your understanding. Just uh, you should know that they exist. So if you decided to build data capabilities from scratch, then most likely you will be looking for opportunity to accelerate your journey, right? So this blueprint is exactly uh, uh, designed to build that, that goal to uh, accelerate it. And we implemented it as a cloud formation script that describes all the zones that John mentions, bronze, silver, gold. Uh, it has roles and permissions. Um, it implements tokenization using EMR. Uh, it has Lambda and step functions that orchestrate flows. And uh, it has pre-configured lake formation. 
and other components that you will uh, see in the template, including uh, the synthetic data set that um, uh, John mentioned that, that he generated. Um, so uh, this, uh, the, this cloud formation script uh, looks like uh, a, a set of instructions and uh, implement and uh, executed by cloud by AWS cloud formation service and it creates infrastructure necessary for data lake in order to uh, you, you can request this uh, cloud formation script after the demo and we will send it to you uh, once you get it you can go to cloud formation uh, service uh, choose create a uh, stack with uh, 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 new resources and choose upload uh, a template file. A template file will be uploaded. It's a, uh, and, and you can see it in designer or you can uh, jump quickly to fill it in parameters, provide unique names for um, uh, quarantine uh, role uh, and other zones, zone names, enter EMR uh, and other configuration parameters, click next, uh, enter uh, parameters that are common for all AWS stacks and stack will be uh, created. So if you decided to try it, please let us know. We are happy to help and, uh, uh, and resolve any questions. Uh, all services that I will be showing uh, created based on this stack. We will not sp sp spend time waiting when resources created. So everything is pre-configured. So for example, uh, this stack creates um, all necessary uh, S3 folders. And now you have full infrastructure. So how you can add data to uh, your data lake and what ways to add data exist overall. The easiest way is to do it manually. So you can uh, go, for example, to um, uh, quarantine zone, um, uh, overnight submissions, submissions, and drag and drop uh, file from your uh, local uh, folder with the synthetic data and it will be uploaded uh, to S3. Uh, and that's it, uh, file will be there. And um, once it's saved, uh, Lambda that is listening for any changes in this bucket uh, will trigger uh, data processing uh, step flow, step functions that will uh, tokenize uh, data. Uh, here is an example of uh, one flow execution. Uh, prepare data for tokenization, tokenize data, and uh, orchestrate other EMR jobs, uh, and data will be transformed to parquet format and uh, moved uh, to uh, bronze, silver, and reporting zone. Uh, so uh, everything will happen uh, automatically. Um, so in this in this case, right, you enter data manually, but in most of real life scenarios, you are not copying data manually. So at some point you will need to automate data flow from your local data, uh, uh, from your lo local data system, data center to the cloud. Uh, uh, AWS data migration service is the place where you do it professionally. Uh, so basically with the service, you can uh, create replication instance and uh, specify the type of the instance, the, the size that is needed uh, for your uh, data transfer. You can specify uh, endpoints and uh, source endpoint, target endpoint. And uh, as you see all this list of supported uh, engines um, uh, supported by AWS. And once you created a source and target endpoint and target could be S3 or even streaming um, uh, data sources, right? In, in this uh, scenario, I think we concerned only with S3, uh, you will be able to go to tasks 
uh, data migration or replication tasks and create a task uh, by choosing replication instance and uh, source and target endpoints. And you can enter other parameters such as, I don't know, for example, enable validation. Uh, validation will um, perform after the import uh, validation, uh, quality checks and consistency of all your data. Uh, usually, as you know, these uh, projects uh, consume some time and, and resources. So in case of you, uh, let's say, migrating from relational to relational to RDS, uh, you have to do zero work. All data will be validated um, for you. So DMS, as you see, very uh, powerful service. Uh, you will see examples of data transformation in a template uh, uh, based on AMR, but I wanted to show you serverless way to transform uh, jobs to 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 up implement data transformations. So you can go to Glue service and create and manage uh, choose create and manage jobs. Again, you can uh, choose any source target and then click create. Glue uh, will generate for you transformation uh, script and provide a visual editor for configuring data source, uh, data destination, and uh, for uh, transformations, right? And if you are looking for uh, simple uh, transformations, you can um, uh, configure them, uh, them visually if you would like to uh, perform more comprehensive transformations, you can go to generated script and um, uh, use Python uh, Spark code, PySpark, to uh, apply any business logic that 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 you uh, need. Uh, so you and as of today, version 2.0, 2.0 of uh, Glue. Uh, is super performant uh, before uh, job start time was a kind of slow. Now it's much faster. Um, so we uh, all also, uh, yeah, I mentioned uh, Spark jobs and uh, let's uh, cover a little bit more of a glue. So uh, John mentioned crawl crawlers, uh, right? So Blueprint create creates crawlers for uh, uh, all these uh, S3 folders that will be automatically uh, scanning, crawling your data in folders and add metadata to the Glue data catalog, right? And once metadata is added, uh, and again, script pre-created all these um, uh, databases, you will be able to uh, go into details of, let's say, uh, created reporting database. You can uh, see tables uh, that exist. You can see all, uh, all field names and, and types. Essentially, once crawler added uh, data to catalog, you have a database that you can query now, a uh, 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 very scalable big data database that you can use for SQL queries for data science and, and, and so on. And uh, you basically will be able to query the data and uh, default most comprehensive way to query data is to use Athena service. Uh, you can see uh, data sources, you can select uh, databases and then you can see all tables and you can uh, query uh, tables. So uh, in this case, we uh, query in all 10,000 submissions that were imported uh, into the uh, data lake. And uh, yeah, actually top top 10 uh, submissions, let me query all of them. So you are using just SQL uh, query to uh, query all this data. So all these uh, records were returned in 1.8 um, eight, eight seconds. Um, but um, you can use Athena, you can use S3 Select as another capability to query data from S3 uh, directly. 
And uh, Alexi will show also another way to query data is through um, uh, uh, Amazon Redshift. And the last but not least, uh, with all the services, you need a centralized place to uh, manage permissions, uh, to see crawlers, tables, uh, and all metadata in, in uh, one place. So um, a Blueprint initialized for you a data lake uh, structure and necessary roles. So you can go, for example, to uh, the quarantine zone to uh, uh, raw database and um, uh, look view all tables. You can uh, select a table and uh, manage uh, uh, permissions. Uh, so as you see, we added default roles of data analyst, data engineer, data lake uh, administrator, and you can manage this role. So you have a template for quick start with uh, predefined basic roles. Um, and additional feature I just want to quickly cover, you also can create predefined blueprints with uh, AWS Lake. You can uh, generate incremental database or you can create uh, data snapshots. This is another sort of accelerator that is offered by, uh, by, by Lake Formation. And the uh, last but not least, um, uh, with uh, Lake Formation uh, allows you to share uh, certain data that, that you have in, in tables with uh, accounts that are not a part of your organization, right? So you can grant select permissions, for example, on the, at the level of individual column or uh, table to uh, roles or um, accounts that exist outside of your organization. So for data sharing, this is very important uh, feature. And uh, with that, I will uh, pass microphone to Alexei who will cover uh, Redshift and um, uh, quick side parts of the demo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alec. Uh, let me share my screen. Hope you can see it. Uh, so yeah, as, um, as Oleg has mentioned, um, I'll be going through very briefly Redshift, some of its functionality, and then uh, most of the time I'll spend uh, showing the quick site, uh, which is the AWS BI and data analysis tool. So let's start with the Redshift. Uh, the way you get to it is similar to how you get to pretty much all AWS services through the console. You go to the Redshift and you get to a portal. And there are a few things I want to show today. So first, you need to create a Redshift cluster. Uh, let's see what it looks like. You put a name, you choose whether it's a production cluster or you just want to try it out uh, free or then you go into choosing a particular configuration for a cluster depending on your storage and uh, compute requirements. You choose how many nodes you want to have. And then you uh, present it with an estimate for how much you, you'll need to pay, uh, what was the cost going to be. And then you proceed with creation of a cluster. Once it is created, you will see it on a, on a dashboard. And uh, here there are a few things you can do from the uh, dashboard. You can, for example, resize or modify the configuration. You can reboot shell you need, but you can also pause, for example, not to pay for compute uh, when you're not using it. Uh, you can do some user access management. You can um, configure user truth limits, encryption, some, some of other admin tasks. And now as Oleg mentioned, I want to show you a, a recent addition to this portal functionality, uh, an ability to, you know, without any external tools, start working with the cluster, start, you know, issuing the queries and um, getting something out of the Redshift. And here we have a script which we use to prepare the data for the demo today. You can use DDL or DML commands, like for example, here we created a table. There are a couple of interesting statements maybe to consider. The first one is this. Uh, 
here we create an external schema and external database. Now uh, it uses the Redshift Spectrum functionality, which ultimately allows you to uh, query the data not only in the Redshift cluster, but uh, you know in other databases of AWS through the data catalog. It's pretty handy; you can query it within the same script. Uh, this other statement here, uh, copy from. Uh, shows you how simple it is to actually ingest uh, the data from S3 bucket to to AWS, or oh, sorry, to the Redshift. So you specify where it is, you specify the role to access S3 bucket. Uh, you can use the same command to actually upload the data back to S3 shell you need it. You can schedule these commands, you can turn it to a Lambda function and, and so on. Now, with all that, obviously Redshift is a you know cloud data warehouse, uh, there is a lot to that, all the query types, the data modeling, optimizations it has for all the, you know, data warehouse workloads. Uh, it's not a, you know, particular topic of today's session. We will uh, very likely have another session just specifically on Redshift. But uh, I wanted to give you a, a quick, uh, a brief idea of what it is and uh, you know how handy it is to use it and with that i want to transition to the and the main part of my uh, presentation which is the quick site again the way you get to it is similar to uh, other services through the console now before we start maybe a couple of uh, words about quick site uh, you know what makes it different uh, and uh, I think there are a couple of things matter. First, it is serverless. So you're not dealing with any servers. You don't need to provision, under provision, over provision, <laughs> like all these things come inevitably if you do any any uh, provisioning. So it's serverless, you don't bother with it. It just scales uh, to how much actually your users need. Uh, and the second thing is to keep in mind it has pay per session pricing. Uh, which is pretty unique in the BI tool set world. Uh, and if you have very you know, diverse uh, uh, group of users with different usage patterns, some of them very often, some of them very rare, it can be very economical. Now, with all that, there are three main areas to uh, consider in a quick site. These are the data sets, analysis, and dashboard. So let's start with data sets. This is the first thing you do. So here on a new data set page, you can see all the different you know, sources of data you may use from files to all their AWS data services to other data applications or you know, your particular functional applications or systems. Now, when you created the data sets, you will see them on, the, on a single page. So here, for example, we have a sample of three data sets, Athena data sets and Redshift. Uh, but not just this thing, uh, SPICE, the label. Uh, so the SPICE stands for the super fast parallel in-memory computational uh, engine, uh, which is the uh, you know, ultimate speed up for uh, quick sites uh, due to in-memory and John mentioned it. So you have, in each AWS account has certain allowance, how much data you can put there and you have control how you fresh, uh, how you refresh it. You can do it manually. You can schedule these things. You can also control security to this data, and so on. Uh, during the preparation of a data set, you can have a look at your data. You can see the structure, the fields. You can preview the data here. Uh, you're not bound to use single source for a data set. You can uh, combine data, you can have multiple things, you can combine your whatever redshift with a file you upload and things like that. Um, what's more, you can add calculated fields to your data. What's even more interesting, you can augment it with SageMaker, with machine learning models, uh, you know, your custom builds or, or pre-built ones. And uh, here, yeah, the idea is once you finish the data set preparation, you go to the second area analysis, which is the main one. This is where you create uh, dashboards. You have ultimately dashboard authoring experience. So let's see how, how it looks like. Uh, so first, as I said, you, you kind of need to have data sets. So you, you have one we pre-configured here, but once again, you're not bound to use only one for a dashboard, you can also, uh, you know, adds another ones and combine and link and uh, use data from number of sources on in one dashboard. You can also add things like 
calculated fields uh, from, from the dashboard board builder. Now, once you selected your data set, you have a list of fields which are in, in this data and they are kind of coded uh, depending on whether it's uh, categories, whether it's values, whether it's uh, dates or geolocation data, etc. So you kind of understand your structure. And then on the bottom here, you have all the different widget types uh, which you ultimately use to build your, your dashboard. Now, here we've pre-built one, pre-configured, uh, and uh, on the top line, we have insights, and I'll be talking about insights today in, in more depth. Uh, and then you have different types of charts. You have pivot table, you have a uh, line chart, your funnel, your map, uh, geo view, and the world, uh, world cloud, things like that. So each chart has its own uh, configuration and functionality, uh, which you can use for kind of interactive analysis. Uh, so for example, here on a line chart, we have a quarterly uh, date resolution, you can click or any user can click and drill down to month and then even even uh, daily data. So it's this kind of interactive analysis. On a pivot table and other charts as well, you have some standard functionality like exporting data to CSV or Excel or doing conditional formatting. There are also custom actions, like for example, we pre-configured that once we select a particular cell here, all of other uh, widgets on a dashboard get sort of focused on this data point or, or a chunk of data we uh, want to zoom in. Uh, so it's pretty handy. You also may notice that the cells on the pivot, they not only show you values, they also show you the trends in the data as it was coming in. Uh, there are other kind of extended functionality, pieces of functionality for uh, for analysis. Like for example, you see a spike here, you may question, okay, what, what, what's going on? And you can click on this data point and uh, choose to analyze contributors. Uh, basically, then you uh, can choose all the different categories of other fields you want to analyze this uh, change against. And I pre-selected some here, I choose my date range, and I can very quickly uh, run the analysis and get an idea of sensitivity of this change to uh, the uh, other fields or other dimensions I chosen to, to maybe have some idea of what's going on. Uh, and that's functionality basically for every user. Um, now let's, talk a little bit about insights, which is I find fascinating about QuickSight. So there are three types of pre-built machine learning powered uh, insights in QuickSight. Uh, and they are narratives, anomaly detection, and forecasts. So let's quickly go into each of these categories. So narratives, it's human readable description of what's going on. And even when you start building your dashboard and select your data, you can go to this insights tab and uh, QuickSight will kind of suggest based on your data, what are different, uh, you know, patterns and stories which may be going on in this data. And you can choose to bring it to your dashboard and, and show it to your users. If you're not happy with what has been suggested, you can uh, add an insight here uh, and choose from a, a long list of different types of insights and uh, you choose it and then you can customize a narrative and select particular data fields uh, this insight will be focused on. Now, uh, so this is the, the narrative, the human readable description. Uh, the second type is the anomalies and uh, we uh, have put this widget here, which says, okay, there was one anomaly on a uh, 27th of April in Virginia, the claim amount was higher than, uh, you know, expected. And a user can then go and zoom into this data, and basically look at the vicinity of this data and, and analyze what is, what is going on. So they see the data point, they can as well do the contribution analysis and, and see the sensitivities. They can feedback uh, whether they find this anomaly detection useful or not. What's more, they can use this menu on top here to 
uh, just different model parameters. So to, to kind of fine tune the anomaly detection mechanism uh, to get rid of false positives or false negatives and so on. So I, I hope you appreciate how easy and handy it is for you know maybe BI user to get access to such functionality. Now, the last type, uh, type of the ML insight is the forecast. And the way for me to show it is if I had just a new, uh, you know, new widgets, for example, I uh, choose it to be a line chart, and then I uh, decide to put a claim date as my X axis. And for example, I choose a claim amount uh, to, to, be, to be presented. It's a bit granular, so let me adjust how I aggregate. Let me aggregate by months. So, okay, this is just visualization of uh, the, the claim amount by, by month. Um, I can go further. I can click here and uh, add forecast and quick site automatically adds this kind of projection for this data. Uh, now it is, as I mentioned, ML machine learning based. Uh, so it is in some ways better than statistical. For example, it will get rid of outliers. It will uh, take into account a uh, number of other fields and parameters, etc. Uh, again, see how handy it is. Um, but then the data analyst can go further. They can do some scenario analysis. So they can click on any data point of this forecast and uh, do what if. Uh, so for example, uh, QuickSight believes it's 16 million uh, something data point. Let me change it to 10 million. I strongly believe that it will be that. And QuickSight immediately adjusts and, and take this input uh, and adjust the forecast. So it can be as well, you know, pretty handy for data analysis. So with that, uh, I kind of covered the insights. I uh, want to mention a couple of other things. Uh, QuickSight is available not only as this uh, uh, tool for, uh, you know, as a part of the AWS console, you can embed it into your web portals, other systems, et cetera, expose it to a wide range of uh, your colleagues, internal users, or, or your clients. And uh, in this embedding experience, uh, you often, okay, if you make it a part of your product or external system, you kind of want it to look like exactly as, you know, you, you design it to be as per your brand or per requirement. So you have quite a bit of capabilities uh, in this regard. So for, for example, you can uh, adjust the visual style by using themes. You can define your themes, etc., and all the widgets will will uh, adjust. Also, every um, chart here has uh, all the different settings to adjust the visual style from fonts, labels, sizes, everything. So you can actually uh, achieve pretty much pixel perfect design uh, with this capability, uh, uh, and it will look exactly like the, the website. Um, now, once you finish building this dashboard, uh, there are a couple of things you can do. Uh, you can either share it with your colleagues who have the same authoring um, sort of access, who can edit uh, dashboards and, and use your dashboard for the analysis, but you can also publish it to the readers, basically consumers who have uh, you know, smaller set of functions, not, not really editing the dashboard, but they can just consume it and do the interactive analysis. And here you select, you can select what functionality will be available for them in this reader experience and whatnot. Now, once you published it, it becomes accessible in this third area, which is the dashboard. So this is your kind of reader experience. This is that dashboard being published to others. Uh, same, um, you know, they, they can pretty much use all the interactive functionality and so on. The last thing I want to mention is uh, we put a little, if I manage to get through this uh, Zoom menu, we put a little demonstration of the embedded functionality. So this is, we embedded exactly the same dashboards into the uh, web portal. Uh, now, uh, you have pretty extensive security settings here. So you can uh, go from uh, basically having the same functionality as you have on a quick site itself with all the 
tabs and all their ability to create new analysis, new uh, data sets, etc. But you can also limit it in, in the embedding API. You can choose, for example, to restrict users from uh, seeing other data sets, seeing other analysis. Uh, you know, they may be able to create new dashboards, but not create new data sets or query the data which is out there in AWS. So it's pretty extensive what you can do. The UI itself, it's responsive, it adjusts the screen size and, and mobile and things like that. Uh, with all that, I want to conclude my part of the demo and uh, back to Peter and hopefully we get to some questions. Thank you so much, Alexia and Oleg. That was awesome. Um, fantastic content. All right, so our Q&A panel is empty, which means that none of the, uh, none of the participants have typed anything in, but uh, we still have time for you guys to do that if you want to uh, have our panelists address anything in particular. I mean, I, I understand this is a lot of content to, to digest in a short amount of time, and a lot of it was fairly specifically technical, but still, we're happy to take any questions if we have them. Mm -hmm. um, if not, that's okay too. So just uh, to remind you guys, we'll be sharing both the link to the recording once the recording is up, as well as the slides that you saw. And if you're interested in exploring this uh, solution accelerator, we're very happy to share the CloudFormation script with you. Just reach out to us um, either through the website or by responding to the um, webinar invite and we'll get in contact with you and work with you mm -hmm. through the details of the solution. Uh, question from Albert. Uh, Oleg, yeah. do you want to take a look? Yeah, 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 absolutely. There is foreign currency. There is not a no conversion, uh, but you can add your calculated fields and uh, if you have um, a FX rate data set, you can easily uh, calculate um, uh, target currency uh, values, but definitely formatting and uh, uh, control of uh, decimal separators is, is built in and uh, the uh, currency uh, label is there. So uh, all, all that is supported. So one, this is John, John. So one thing I did at a reinsurer who dealt with um, numerous claims, as you can imagine, for many different jurisdictions and different currencies, they had to report in euros, they had to report in US dollars, they had to track their balances um, in Jamaican dollars, if they were getting claims in from Jamaica, for example, they had all kinds of different currency issues. Um, a, a good and simple approach to take would be to uh, leverage a uh, foreign currency API to um, call that as needed and to calculate and store copies of the data. It's a simple calculation, as you know, but store copies of the data um, in the data lake and then label them as such. And when you, when you do the filtering in your queries or in QuickSight, you can just pick the base currency that you'd like to see the numbers in. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Albert, for your question. You have a follow-up question, so uh, uh, Oleg can probably take that, and, and then uh, we'll go, get to the question from George. Uh, yeah, so this is not a finished product that we are selling or uh, licensing. Uh, what we see uh, in each and every case when organization decides to build its own data lake, they have, uh, in most of cases, unique requirements. So. Uh, this uh, 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 this blueprint establishes the, the foundation and, and patterns, right? And can help you to save maybe two to three months initially in um, developing a kind of, in, in programming or configuring data lake you, using all these uh, patterns, security patterns, architecture patterns that are uh, covered by, by, by John. Uh, we provide uh, several other examples. So for example, we have accelerator of uh, processing uh, uh, voice information from uh, call centers and extracting uh, sentiment analysis. And you can combine um, um, sentiment analysis uh, cloud formation template with uh, data lake formation template and output to dashboard, um, uh, you know, uh, basically structured and unstructured information, right? Uh, let's say 
client satisfaction da dashboard or something like that. So I, I hope that answers um, your question. Right. And, it just, uh, just occurred to me that we should have said the question out loud. It's not clear that the uh, uh, viewers of the recording are gonna see the question. Okay. So the question was if this is a finished product or it's in development. And uh, essentially what this is an, is an accelerator. We're uh, a services firm. So we engage with customers to build custom, uh, design and build custom systems platforms. Uh, something that you can't buy off the shelf. So, uh, and we use this as a means to accelerate that particular journey. We, we give it away with our service, so to speak. Yeah, I probably want to bring it back to what John was describing in the very beginning, this kind of two-way door and the ultimate flexibility. So by choosing going, uh, you know, to go to the clouds, you, for, you know, for, for many clients, they choose that for flexibility. So we don't, think of it as a product which fixes you in a particular architecture type, et cetera. It's just something which accelerates you starting this, uh, starting your journey, starting to get there, but then you ultimately still have all the flexibility, you know, these new services will appear, new use cases will appear for you and you just extend it, enhance, change certain things. And, you know, it's not a fixed product you get yourself onto and uh, live with it forever. Okay, let me start answering probably the most uh, heavy question <laughs> today. Can you compare contracts, contrast the AWS uh, lake house construction and maintenance with options from uh, other uh, vendors? Oleg, uh, before you do, just a very quick time check. We have two minutes uh, and yeah, change yeah. to go. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Uh, so on, on a very uh, high, high level, uh, th this comparison would be rather co comprehensive and uh, detailed, right? Uh, I would say lake formation on, on AWS, the benefits of it is ability to have integrated services uh, in, in, and, and cover all your needs uh, in, in one place. Uh, most of other vendors also like, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, Snowflake is uh, uh, positioning uh, them as a solution for data lake as well. I, I would say specialized solutions have uh, more limited cap capabilities uh, 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 such as uh, um, Delta Lake or uh, Azure def definitely provide uh, components, but then there are specific uh, pros and cons for each and every and uh, the strong part of AWS Lake is is, um, is integration and uh, I would say cost efficiency comparing to other uh, lakes uh, is, is a plus. If you don't mind we will follow up and probably discuss this question in depth uh, after that session considering we have only one minute left. <laughs> Thank you, Oleg. Yeah, that, that's something that's impossible to address in two minutes, but uh, it's a very valid question uh, for sure. Uh, with that, I think this is a good place to wrap up. Thank you so much again, John, for joining us. And thank you for all your help in, in uh, fleshing out the solution itself. Oleg, Alexei, thanks as always. Uh, great job. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. I hope you found this valuable and useful. Again, you'll, you'll receive follow-ups from us. If you want to continue the conversation around uh, your data journey in the cloud, we're very happy to engage with you and help you uh, make the next steps on that journey. Thank you so much, and we'll see you at the next webinar.